one of the most famous uh, TV games in the US, like as famous as the millionaire who wants to be a millionaire. And uh, one of the biggest, uh, so there have been uh, some uh, very basic uh, success, successes from uh, artificial intelligence uh, over the years. The first one, uh, like that went into the news. The first one was probably the Deep Blue, where the, it was the first time that the, the computer made by IBM managed to beat uh, Kasparov in chess. So that was uh, when in the early 90s, and ultimately, no, no, it was uh, after 2000, right? The uh, blue, blue was in during the 90s. It was in the 90s, the blue, because they had two approaches, right? They had the first, the first one that they Kasparov won, but then uh, the blue won uh, the second time. Okay, and then uh, the I think the other big uh, breakthrough was the the computer that again IBM made, the Watson. Uh, it was called Watson, the computer, and the, the and it managed to beat the the best players in, uh, in um, uh, the best players so over the whole uh, the over the whole history of the of the game Jeopardy. The difficulty there is uh, mostly to understand the question. So what uh, what is the question asked? Actually, yeah, I mean you have to know the rules for this. And uh, Pablo was a part of the of the team that uh, that developed the system at the, that developed the IBM software that was able to that was able to uh, to beat this uh, the Jeopardy. And now Pablo is a data scientist. In, uh, he moved to Vancouver. And uh, he's a data scientist there, working on uh, uh, working on as a freelancer, lay like, on uh, many on many problems. And uh, recently, he, so he wrote this uh, book uh, this year that I told you also last time. I have put also the, uh, the book in the web, so you are very well uh, the book uh, the link on the web. So it's I read the half of it, so it's uh, I really like it. So I I recommend it uh, because it's a topic that. Uh, requires experience to like to, to have work a lot with data and uh, what, what I teach in the uh, and uh, my experience for example is not as my as, uh, as high because I mostly teach these things but I have not worked on as many projects so I like it very much because it's uh, written by somebody who has uh, experience on this type of, uh, of uh, you know all the data managing you have to do so he will talk to us uh, today a bit about that so thanks a lot Pablo for uh, being here I'm thanks so much for 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 having me i uh, look forward to uh, uh, interacting with with uh, the students oh, and, uh, great the slides are you seeing the slides yeah all right uh, let me see there we go okay so this i have a fairly oop, uh, wrong button uh, there we go again. Uh, there we go. Okay, so I have a fairly um, ambitious lecture. We'll see how uh, we go through it. Um, so you, you are in data engineering, uh, and uh, uh, picture engineering involves many activities also for um, uh, data scientists. I'm going to try to give you a little bit of the flavor of the type of things uh, that data scientists may be doing also in feature engineering for, so you have an idea of the type of support and, and activities you will be doing to, to help. Um, the nice thing about feature engineering is that it really needs data engineering and data science working hand in hand to accomplish the goals. And if you, uh, is it one of these places where data engineering really shines because if, um, the processing is not done, is done in a silly way. It's going to take a very, very long time or just be unfeasible. So we're going to have um, the lecture in four segments. The first one, we're going to touch a little bit of concepts. Many of these concepts, most probably you, you are somewhat familiar with. Then we're going to talk about combining and expanding features. Um, the meat of the lecture is mostly feature reduction and projection, which is uh, almost like a synonym of, of feature engineering in, in many aspects. And then I'm going to discuss very briefly about uh, large data sets and, and, and feature engineering. Uh, so um, so my background was already covered by, by, by the professor. I just wanted to highlight that in the Jeopardy system, uh, we have a cascade of, of 
four different models that were feeding each other and using transfer learning and stuff. So feature engineering uh, in, in the job party system was key for the success of, of the system. And um, that was uh, what sparked my interest on the, on the topic. So in this uh, lecture, I assume uh, you're familiar with, with supervised learning, basically classifiers or regressors. And uh, I distinguish raw data, so basically the, the, the information that comes directly from the uh, definition of the problem and features, which are pieces of information extracted from that or assembled from that raw data. And then when we are doing classification or regression, we have instances, we have a target class or a target value. Uh, from that perspective, we can expand the machine learning cycle um, from this concept of we do exploratory data analysis, normally over the raw data. We ex uh, learn some data insights, decide which model we are going to use and which metric we will evaluate and take that raw data and run it through a program uh, called a featureizer that produces feature vectors. Then over those feature vectors, we have the usual train test split um, or cross-validation, we build models and we evaluate them on unseen data. Many times uh, for brevity, the ML cycle starts from the feature vectors, but to really um, define feature engineering, you need to start from raw data. So from there, we're gonna write a feature engineering definition. So feature engineering is a process of representing a problem domain to make it amenable for learning and involves initial discovery of features under a stepwise improvement. And it's based on domain knowledge and the observed performance of, of a given uh, algorithm over a specific training data. So what we want are good features. Yes, we want features that are informative, that describe something that makes sense to a human, that are useful. Yes, that is, so they are defined for as many instances as possible. And they are discriminant. They divide instances according to uh, difference on the target classes. Um, so, before we were talking about the machine learning cycle, the machine learning cycle is one part of a feature engineering cycle. And in the feature engineering cycle, we will take some raw data and we will iterate machine learning cycles, starting from that raw data and finding features and then improving those features based on the insights. So before we were doing exploratory data analysis, before starting in the feature engineering cycle, we do error analysis after doing an execution. And error analysis is quite important from data engineering because you need to instrument the machine learning. It's not enough to just have the model. You need to be able to understand how different mistakes made by the model come from difference in the input data. Uh, the thing uh, as, as a theme in, in machine learning is to avoid overfitting, avoid getting a model that um, learns quirks of the training data that don't really appear on production. Um, feature engineering is a great place to overfit horribly. Yes, so you say, oh, I'm using cross-validation. My model is not overfit. Yes, your model may not be overfit based on your construction, but by doing a, a, a feature engineering uh, cycle without quality um, scheduling of the data you are using, you may uh, overfit your features, which is a, a separate issue. So you, you have to use data in stages. Uh, another way of thinking feature engineering is that you are trading amount of data with, with expert human time, yes? So as you are familiar in computer science, uh, as you, you've been using the uh, previous algorithm books, you have this trade off between time and space. Yes, you can speed up things by using a cache that uses more RAM, and you can use less RAM and doing multiple passes on the data, which takes more time. Uh, from my perspective, feature engineering is a similar thing between having a lot of training data, in which case you can use, for example, deep learning, which synthesize features, or having a, an expert or, or human uh, with insights about the problem that adds um, features that are more meaningful. Uh, this, of course, doesn't help building autonomous intelligence systems, but it helps uh, solve problems. So many times feature engineering, th therefore, is used in, in problems with small data sets. It's very popular in fields like medicine, where you have to, I don't know, cut somebody up to, to obtain a feature. Uh, so you want to really minimize the number of instances you have. Okay, so, so from my perspective, then feature engineering is quite a human in the loop type of process. 
uh, that is in hinges on exploratory data analysis, where you analyze data sets to summarize their characteristics, and you make hypotheses about the data. And then on error analysis, and in general, when you hear error analysis, you think, okay, you, you, you look at the accuracy, you look at the precision, you look at the recall, you, you look at aggregate metrics. So they're a good place, but uh, they are not enough for doing feature engineering. For feature engineering, what you want to do is you want to look at individual erroneous instances or, or classes of instances that are failing and um, make a hypothesis of why this system is failing on those particular instances. For that, you really need a properly instrumented system. You need to be able to say, okay, I have these mistakes and I want to go back somehow and, and see which training data is contributing to those errors. And once you have identified these classes, uh, you, you can hypothesize changes to the feature set to address those classes. But of course, you also need to make sure that these classes you have identified are frequent enough. And again, that requires more instrumentation. Uh, I think in the previous uh, lecture, you have seen clustering. So in a way, you, you need to be able to cluster your instances and says, okay, these mistakes affects this whole um, set of instances, therefore it's, it's frequent enough because you don't want to over-optimize or, or over-engineer. By far, one of the most uh, uh, easier ways to do feature engineering is to just do a feature drill down, have a feature that is poor, that you, you realize that it's not helping and you just drop it, yes? Or find features that are good and you expand them, you make more variations of them, you combine them. This is quite important for data engineering because these combinations um, can take a long time if you were to reprocess all your data. So smart caching and a smart um, pushing of this type of combinations can make uh, quite a difference. Um, of course, there is a question also is how do you come up with features? This is more on the data science side. And, but for uh, data engineering, uh, more and more companies and, and organizations are moving to what's called feature stores, which are um, uh, organization-wide um, repositories of algorithms that extract features. So these are the different sources that people use to build these feature stores. Just think how you solve the problem yourself. You look at published works, look at blogs, right, books, um, open source projects, yes. And um, this type of uh, information is um, quite important then to be shared um, in organizations. Um, this is a quote from um, a lecture from 1989, The Real World of Technology. You can find the, the lectures online, they're quite good. I like this quote a lot, tools often redefine a problem. So if, if you're only familiar with one particular type of technology like deep learning, then all you think of is in terms of convolutions or, or in terms of um, uh, recurrent neural nets. And sometimes something simpler that uh, will be much efficient uh, in terms of time to deployment and, and execution will escape you. So. I, I, we normally think a lot about the problems, but we don't realize that, well, tools often redefine the problem. So as um, Ari mentioned, I wrote this book and the book contains, uh, half the book is uh, five case studies that uh, have released open source, it's 10,000 lines of Python, and also comes with an open data set called Wikicities, uh, where I take the same problem, which is a prediction of the population of towns and cities, and address it using their properties, their textual description, the historical population and satellite imagery. imagery. Um, this data set has around 80,000 cities and um, it, it is large enough to uh, make your Spark cluster take a few seconds to process it. So, but, um, so, but it's small enough that can still be handled with, with, with Python. And I will be showing some examples from here. So in this lecture, I, I, do I do say, well, if you want to learn more about this topic, you can look at this particular cell in this particular notebook, it refers to this uh, code. Okay, so let's talk now about combining features. Yes. Um, in a way, if, if I tell you to do a, a, a classification task and I give you some feature value, you will not, and you're not familiar with the problem, 
what would you ask? Well, what's the value of the other features uh, for other instances? Yes, you, you will try to put that number into context. You will use the other instances to build a context to see, well, this is a big number, this is a small number, this is common, right? So in the same way, we want the machine learning to be able to uh, get an idea about um, how the different features um, values happen regarding to all the other instances. Um, the other thing is sometimes we have variations that the computer, the, the machine learning algorithm thinks are meaningful variations, but we know they are not, yes? So for example, if you have an image and you rotate them slightly, that variation is not meaningful to say whether um, a giraffe is upside down or not. Yes, it's still a giraffe. Uh, that's where the cover of the book comes actually. So these things are called nuisance variations. Yes, these are variations that in a way annoy the machine learning system, but don't help it actually quite the opposite. So we want to remove them. We want to concentrate the variations that co contain um, a signal to the target class. So combining features allow us to um, uh, focus that. However, that's actually quite hard in large data sets because many times the data sets are not even fixed in time. So here is a, a, a topic that could be quite of interest for, for their engineering. So one of the first things you will do for combining features is, is to do a normalization, yes? Uh, again, we are taking variations and we are dropping information to try to concentrate. So in a type of normalization, for example, is you scale the values. So you have a value between minus 100 and, and 5,000 and you move it so that it goes between zero and one or minus one and one. Some machine learning algorithms require all their data to be um, in a specific range to operate. Uh, you can do things further. You can also squash their probability distribution so it's, it's normally shaped um, and um, different types of standardization. Um, again, if you throw the information that is useful for the machine learning, then it's gonna operate worse. And also it is hard to compute these things if the data is changing continuously or if the data is very large. But sometimes you can just do a sample over the whole data set and that will be enough to obtain the, the normalization parameters. Uh, going even further, you can do things like the correlation, smoothing, you can weigh different features, yes. So these are all type of operations you will do when you are combining features and each of them has their own uh, issues for, for their engineering. Um, a topic that used to be very popular in the 80s and 90s is discretization. You take a floating point number and you re um, reduce it into a, an integer class. And, and again, here the idea is that certain small differences in a number that come maybe from a measuring uh, device are not meaningful, but the overall class of the number is important. Um, one of the things that I find that uh, it's not that popular that uh, is quite useful is that you can also do discretize um, discretization, uh, supervised discretization. Uh, we're all familiar with, with binning that we just take the number and say, okay, I'm gonna take the first digit say, or uh, I'm gonna split it into 10 different uh, segments. But um, if you have, uh, if you're doing supervised classification, you can use the class and say, I'm going to make my uh, uh, discretization be aware of the target class. And that's, um, there are some pretty good algorithms for that uh, proposed in the past, like uh, MLDP and came. The, these algorithms are, uh, quite complex. I haven't seen extensions of these algorithms for large data sets, which is a, quite an interesting topic. Um, other ways to, to combine the features is instead of looking at the features um, as they come, is to compute uh, representative statistics of them, particularly if we have a lot of uh, similarly looking features like pixel data. Uh, by far the most common thing there is histograms or as we call it in natural language processing, bag of words, where you just take the amount, the count, how each of these features appears in a given instance. Uh, but those are not the only type of descriptive features you can take. You can also take maximum, minimums, averages, or statistics about uh, the distribution like skewness, yes. Oops. 
Now, if you have um, a sparse feature vector, like a, a, a word vector, um, a vector that has a zero if a word appears, uh, or, or, or one if a word appears, uh, zero if a word does not appear in a sentence, in a text, and one if the word appears, and you change it using representative statistics, you will get a dense feature vector. So feature vector is much smaller, but all the entries are defined. This uh, actually changed execution of, of many machine learning algorithms quite a bit. So you have to be uh, uh, careful that when you are doing feature engineering, you may end up with a feature vector that will make your machine learning algorithm choke and, and, and become intractable. So that was about combining features. Something else we can do is we can take the, the raw data or the features we, we have been working so far and expand them. Uh, that uh, might sound uh, like a bad idea because in general you have too many features and you're always trying to reduce them. But uh, many times if you add a few new features, you can have plenty of values, particularly using the concept of computable features. So you take, um, you, you are executing small programs on the features to obtain new ones. And other examples of computable features also involve imputation and, and smoothing. Uh, so these are uh, these little programs in many times go into these uh, feature stores I was mentioning. And say, if you believe that um, multiplication between two features is a better predictor than any of the two features alone, sometimes you will need a lot of training data for the machine learning algorithm to realize that this multiplication is, is a good thing. And, and some al machine learning algorithms don't even have multiplying features as part of their um, uh, modeling uh, space. So if you believe this is useful, then you can add it. So, and alternatively, you can also just do single feature transformations. Yes, um, again, all these things is based on um, a lot of uh, intuitions about the data and the problem. From a data engineering perspective, you have to make sure that you have this operator palette available to, to data scientists. So you will be able to do things like log x, x square, square root of x, etc. Um, a particular uh, case of uh, single feature transformation is one hot encoding, where you take a categorical and replace it by a, a number of features, uh, Boolean based, whether one category appears there or not. Um, something that uh, came from a thesis in 2017 that I found quite interesting is that if you have an expression like x1 minus x2, and you produce a number of training instances for different values of x1 and x2, and try to train a neural net to predict that, uh, it will still um, vary quite a bit the, the results you get, yes? And, and some of the expressions, like for example, ratios, uh, have very high uh, error rate, yes? In comparison to trying to learn a, a difference, yeah? So if you believe that a ratio is important for this problem, you, you, you could try adding features uh, for ratios. And as I mentioned, drilling down features uh, is a great way of uh, doing, um, uh, improving the performance of the classifier. Yes, yeah, so for example, if it's binary, you can transform it in a probability based on how well it correlates to the target class or if it's categorical. Uh, you can reduce the number of categories or, or you can threshold it or split into beans if it's uh, discrete. Yeah, so this type of, of refinement is, is something you, you want to be able to um, uh, provide. Uh, in the same part of expanding the, the information, uh, we have the idea of handling missing data. Yes, um, it's very common to have instances that are missing a particular feature. Yes, this could be due to problems in acquisition, artifacts, merging data from different sources, um, and different machine learning libraries handle missing data uh, differently, uh, and it can have a great impact. Um, uh, this is a technique called target rate encoding for encoding um, <clears throat> categorical data. Uh, yeah, so this technique is uh, quite useful. And the idea is that you are trying to use the context again, trying to see how many times a particular feature value uh, 
correlates with a particular category, the uh, target class. Yes. So let's say you have a, a feature that 80 times, 80% 80 of the time, the feature is true. You are trying to predict a class that has two values. Yes. And the target class is also true. Yes. Uh, so instead of having the, the original feature saying true or false, you set it to 0 0.8. And in this way, uh, you can take uh, categories and make them all look much similar to each other. Yes, because instead of looking at what the value of the category is, you look at how many times this category is this, uh, predicts the, the target class. So here's a little example. We have a feature that has three values, three categories, A, B, and C, and a target class that can be positive or negative. And if we can see here, when A uh, appears, the target class is always positive. So then our target rate encoding is 1.0. When B appears, 40% of the time is uh, positive. So it's 0 0.4 and C is 0 0.5. So now instead of having this categorical feature, uh, F, we have the target rate encoding for F that uh, is a floating point number. And this way we make the feature much more informative. But if you are um, uh, following this, uh, this give you a uh, way, you are actually overfitting, you are leaking the value of plus and minus into the way you, we computed these numbers. So from a data engineering perspective, to, to do target rate encoding correctly, you need to compute these uh, scores in a held out data set. Um, the same goes from any other techniques that do supervise feature engineering. So before you will split the data into train set, development set, and test set, now you also need to have a feature engineering um, uh, parameter adjusting set. And there are other expansion techniques like decomposing complex features and, and pivoting. This all goes into, and you can also use external data to, to expand uh, the features. Um, for example, if, if you are using GPS locations, you may want to use a um, database of uh, cities and use this to um, expand with a distance to a major city on your data set. Um, so back to the missing data. Uh, something that is quite important when you have missing data is to add uh, a flag that indicates that the, the, that particular feature was missing in the original data set. Yeah, so uh, when you have a data set that is missing data, it is, uh, uh, you need to find a way to calculate some value there so your machine learning algorithm will run. This is called imputation and is, uh, finding the correct number to, to put there is, is quite a problem. Uh, you basically want to put a, a number there that makes the machine learning ignore that feature. So make it as uh, indistinctive as possible. But you also want to keep a flag saying, well, that value there is false. That value there doesn't exist, it was imputed. Um, Imputing um, large data sets and imputing streaming data is also a fascinating topic that um, <clears throat> uh, opens up a lot of data engineering issues. Uh, many times you expand the features just by realizing that the feature is actually not in what will be like database normal form, that it contains multiple information inside that feature. So you, you take that um, normally a string and you explode it into several subfields. This is very common also with dates. Uh, and then we have pivoting going from um, um, <clears throat> data that is aggregated to data that is disaggregated. Th this type of operations are very uh, easy to implement in Spark. And this all boils down to, to the concept of tidy data that is uh, similar to the database normal forms, but uh, translated to data that you want each features to be in one column, each instance to be in a row, and uh, one table for each kind of features and the table should be linked. So my perspective is that uh, 
uh, this is uh, echoed by this uh, quote by uh, Stephen King uh, book that you want to have a, your own toolbox. So when you get into a hard job, instead of getting discouraged, you, you will size the correct tool and get to work. So, so part of, of the training uh, that you are undergoing is to, to find which is the toolbox that uh, you are comfortable with and, and to keep it at hand. Um, any questions, comments, just feel free to uh, jump in. I'm not uh, monitoring the chat that much, but if you have anything, just um, um, uh, wave. So now we go to the reduction and product uh, projection. So because it is very common from doing machine learning directly from the raw data, more or less, yes. So instead of sitting there, studying the data and coming up with features, uh, the time cycle from data science is, is very short. You, you get a database dump, you get this Excel file and you just plug it into the machine learning. And there are plenty of columns into that data that are unrelated to the target class. They are spurious, like um, IDs, uh, things that are not useful. They are all different for every instance. Yes, like, like a comment. Uh, so this excess of uninformative features really bloats the machine learning model with unnecessary parameters. And too many parameters produce suboptimal results or require a lot of training data. So from that perspective, the idea of feature engineering is almost a synonym with feature selection and reduction. And there are two uh, ways of, of dealing with this. One is explicitly dropping certain features, which is feature selection. And the other is to map this sparse feature vector into a smaller dimension with dimensionality reduction. We're gonna see both in, in turn. Why having large feature vector is a bad idea is because of what's called the course of dimensionality. When you have a very large uh, feature um, uh, space, everything looks similar. Yes, it's very hard for the machine learning to tell whether a, a difference in a particular dimension is important when all the other dimensions look kind of the same. Yes, a, a rule of thumb says that you need at least five training instances per dimension. So the more dimensions you have, the more data you will need. Okay, so, uh, some uh, features are so blatantly wrong that you can drop them right away. Yes, so if you have a feature that is different for absolutely every instance, then most probably it's not useful. Uh, or maybe you need to discretize it. That's, that's a, a different uh, issue. Uh, if you have a feature that is the same for every instance, then it's definitely not useful, yeah? And, and this is also quite important because certain algorithms cannot drop features like naive base will, will, will have to compute a score for absolutely every feature you give it. Yes, and also uh, larger feature sets are quite hard for them for humans to under, try to understand the model afterwards. So, so they affect also interpretability. So how do you choose which features to drop? Well, then comes the idea of feature utility. You, um, define a feature over subsets, uh, define a, um, a utility over subset of features. Yes, if, and then you can search the space of subsets, but that's in general intractable and people use um, approximation and greedy methods. Um, so one uh, way of approximating is just to define a feature utility for an individual feature. And um, for that, we can do things like chi-square correlation, firing rate, how many times it defined, the true positive rate, uh, maximum likelihood estimator, how well that feature alone predicts the target class. Um, a particular metric I am fond of is, is this mutual information that computes the amount of bits of information from one random variable given um, another one. And the idea of this is if you can think of the, your feature gossiping about the target class is, is how, how good is the piece of gossip the, the feature is giving you about the target class. Yes, how many bits of information is sharing with you this particular feature about the target class. 
And um, these probabilities here can be computed using counts. Um, and from there, you can rank the features and choose which ones to keep. When you are trying to choose which features to keep, you can say, well, I'm going to keep only 10 features. I'm going to keep only 100 features. Or another way is to say, I'm going to add a completely random feature. And this feature is, is just random numbers. And I'm going to drop everything that is after that feature. Yeah, so if, if mutual information for my random feature is uh, 0 0.005, everything after 0 0.005 is, is going to be dropped. So as I was mentioning, uh, finding the best feature subset is, is, is uh, NP-hard. It's, it's, it's a very complex uh, exponential uh, uh, algorithm. So there are these greedy methods where you can either start with an empty set and start adding one feature at a time, or start with a full set and start dropping features uh, at a time. So they call the forward feature selection or the backward feature selection. And on these algorithms, you can use the metrics we just discussed or you can actually retrain the full system in what's called wrapper methods. So in, in feature uh, forward feature selection, you evaluate each individual feature one at a time, and then you, you pick the feature that better predicts the target class, and you keep adding features um, in as much things keep improving. And this is the incremental construction of the feature set. These techniques, uh, well, will we'll work uh, with large data sets, but uh, you definitely want to do something to uh, have machine learning models that are updatable and that you can reuse the computation you did with the smaller feature set as you keep adding new features. And the same thing happens uh, with the backward selection. You, you, you start with a full set and you start dropping one feature at a time based on the one who, uh, if you drop it, makes it smaller damage to the performance. Um, <clears throat> the, the good thing about the backward feature selection, even though it's computationally more expensive than the forward one, is that it handles interaction between features better. Um, this is called also the ablation study of the feature set. And, and I have an example on, on the uh, Jupyter notebooks. And an alternative to uh, do um, using a feature utility by single feature is to retrain a, a machine learning system for the whole um, uh, data set. Um, this is quite, uh, produce quite good result, but it's very um, intensive in terms of computing time. Something else you can do to um, handle um, features is um, to blacklist different features. Yeah, so in natural language processing, we know that there is these things called stop words. These are words that don't carry semantics for information retrieval and, and many natural language processing tasks like for, a, to, them, etc. So we compile a list of those words, we call it stop words, and we just blankly uh, remove them. So we, we do feature selection on them without computing any scores. Uh, besides explicit feature selection, there are also algorithms that do feature selection as part of their own um, uh, computation. And um, the most common manner is uh, regularization, which is a, a topic uh, that uh, is important to be aware of because it reduces the complexity of the problem and the training time um, doing feature selection without um, explicitly telling you which features are being used. And um, regularization happens for machine learning algorithms that allow you to compute um, explicit size of their model, yes? And then what you do is, uh, so you, you have to compute the explicit size of the model and the machine learning algorithm itself searches on the model space with a function that you can say, okay, that particular function, I also want to penalize for complex models. And depending on the type of penalty you do is the type of regularization you do. Um, so popular regularization techniques includes uh, the, the square of, of, of the norm of the vec feature vector and, and, and uh, of the parameter vector and, and things like that. The, so as 
<clears throat> so some of the algorithms that are more popular for regularization are neural networks and, and uh, logistic regression. And um, the, we will see later on another algorithm that does a type of uh, embedded feature selection without regularization that is quite useful for um, pre-processing large data sets for um, uh, feature selection. Um, and then um, another type of um, um, embedded system that the implicit feature selection is um, dropout in, in neural networks where you, you explicitly uh, bombard your neural net and set some way to zero uh, in different runs. Uh, so this is another way to, to achieve feature selection in an implicit way without resorting to regularization. Uh, so I think I already talked about this and the reason is here is... Um, so the... The problem of predicting the population of, uh, of a town or a city based on, on their properties and text, uh, I started from uh, DBpedia that is a large uh, scale knowledge base extracted from Wikipedia. And it has triples of the form like New York City, leader, title, mayor. And from there for each of the 80,000 cities and towns, I produce a, a feature set of 98 uh, features. And that feature set then in, in this example, so I'm gonna go now through a little example about uh, feature selection on text data. So, yeah, so of these 98 features, they are we're gonna expand them using the text of a Wikipedia page. So the idea is, well, we're trying to predict the size of um, the population of a particular city based on their Wikipedia page. Uh, many Wikipedia pages actually do have the, the population described in the running text, yes. The issue is that uh, for, for this data set, we have 43 million words. So finding where the population appears in, in that text is going to be very hard. Also, the text, if it appears, if the population fit appears, it may have a different puntuation, like two comma one fifty two comma one one one, or it could be said in words like a little over two million. Yes. So in this uh, particular um, example, then we want to see which, and then besides the actual number, you you have certain words. If you say describe the place as a city, it's probably much bigger if you describe it as a hamlet which is a, an English word for a very, very small town. So the first part is to do an exploratory data analysis and, and look at uh, different characteristics. So by looking at a sample of, of the cities, we can see that uh, bigger cities have longer pages. So just the text length is a good uh, feature. And here we can see that uh, in some cities, the population appears directly. Uh, some have different type of puntuations, some have commas, some don't. In some other cities, it doesn't appear at all. Overall, it looks like in half the pages, it, it has the, the population. So for the first featureization, uh, what uh, I do is instead of using words, I only use the numbers. And instead of using the actual number that appears, I use discretization and I divide them into 12 different uh, classes that uh, are meaningful for differences on population. Uh, this is a quite an interesting case because uh, in natural language processing, we, we tend to discard numbers because they have too much variability. Well, in this case, because the numbers are important, uh, I have a custom feature, featureizer that, that just keeps the numbers and, and put them into these categories. But what interests us as an example of feature selection is the second featureization um, that, um, I um, take the words as, as independent features and I compute the mutual information between each of the words and the target class. And I keep only the top uh, thousand words. And the most informative words are in this list. Yes, yeah, so city has the highest utility uh, followed by capital, cities, largest, also major airport, international, yes. Uh, Sadly, some uh, stop words like it's 
done that don't seem to be very informative, uh, just because they are very popular, get into this list. And that's the value of filtering stop words. But, um, but you can imagine that uh, in airport or international correlate with, with larger places. Yes, and the same with capital. Uh, so what I, I'm looking at, um, showing you this example because I want to share with you uh, the error analysis aspect. Uh, because for data engineering, uh, data analysis, error analysis involves a lot of custom construction. It is not uncommon that you will end up having much more code written for error analysis than for model training. Um, so for this, I'm going to switch to the web browser. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Where is the web yeah. Where is my web browser? Ah. Ah, here we go. So, uh, so this is the Jupyter Notebook code for uh, the instrument for the error analysis. And as I was mentioning, the, the code is much longer to, to, to do the error analysis than to actually train the model. And um, what I'm doing here is I am searching for, uh, so I have a base system with 98 features. And then I have added these extra thousand mutual information uh, words. And I'm trying to see which instances did gain the most. So these are the big winners, yes. Uh, so you can see here that um, the, <clears throat> uh, the system uh, was produced. Um, um, predicting 180,000 people, and with information now predicts 3.8 million people. The real population is 8 million. And uh, the other thing we see is how the, the tokens that the system is seeing. So this is the actual text here, but because we're only keeping the thousand most uh, informative words, this is what the machine learning sees. Um, so further along, we can see in the uh, top losers here that the um, many times in, in some of the um, uh, entries that the system lost a lot, there was very few words that were informative that were able to extract. Yes, um, and that's a, another reason, like for example, this one, uh, Bailadores, yes, has a very few uh, words that can be extracted from there, yeah? And um, so this type of um, analysis requires special tooling uh, that um, most probably you will have to design and envision. Mm. Uh, so from that uh, an, uh, analysis uh, we were just looking at, we can see that um, you, you have the, the big winners are city, were cities that were far from the um, uh, Western world, and this is the English speaking Wikipedia. And so they don't have much uh, on, they, their info boxes were not very populated. But then the pages themselves describe the places in detail as, as, as big places. Um, and then um, the ones who were the big losers were places that were big, but for example, it was described as a town, yes. Or another one was a big place, but it has the word agriculture that is normally linked to smaller places or things like that. So this is what I was mentioning. In error analysis, you make hypotheses and um, from there you move forward. So here the hypothesis was that stop words uh, will help. And from there I do other uh, series of visualizations like in stop words, uh, using pairs of words, etc. cetera. Um, and okay, with the time, okay. 
So feel free to ask any questions anytime. And uh, we are going to look now into uh, dimensionality reduction. So, um, so um, the other technique instead of uh, using a feature selection is just to uh, apply um, an automated algorithm to the whole data set and, and the feature vectors and project them uh, to, to a smaller dimension. Yes, um, some techniques include uh, just applying a hashing function, which is uh, kind of crazy, that it actually works. Uh, the other one is to multiply in the, the vector the, by a random vector, a uh, random matrix to do a random projection. Yes, it still looks, it's, it's pretty crazy that it works, but it actually does work. Um, then, uh, then you can do uh, more uh, um, motivated uh, mat matrix to do the multiplication using, for example, a PCA or, or symbol value decomposition, where you try to find the direction of the data set in a linear algebra way. Uh, you can also do clustering and use the number of the cluster as a feature. And you can use a general concept of embeddings uh, that are uh, mappings of vectors, uh, the objects to vectors, so they follow relationships between them. Um, so hashing features is, is the simplest technology uh, thing you can use. You can use uh, hashing functions from data structures or from cryptography. Yes, um, the, the idea is that a hashing function uh, from, from data structure is any function that maps data of arbitrary size to a fixed size and a non-identical da identical data uh, that are mapping to the same hash are called collisions. So good hashing functions minimize collisions. And the intuition is that collisions will be rare. And, the, and if a collision um, happens, the other features will inform the machine learning uh, which of the original feature was seen. Yes. And, and there are some machine learning uh, systems like fast text that they use hashing as, as a key component. So here I have a little example for you. Uh, I took uh, uh, an Italian dictionary from uh, uh, Genio Linux. Uh, has 100,000 uh, entries, and I map them into 4,000 features. Yes, so that's a significant reduction on the feature space. And um, so for the, the first class, for example, maps all these 29 words to the same hash. So what this means is that uh, if you, uh, the machine learning see the word idiomi, uh, it will not be able to know whether it's idiomi or burlato. It's, yes, and if it's, it's a, so, so you have words here that are completely unrelated to each other. Uh, monake, but uh, well, burlato and burlando seems related. That's quite unusual that you, you will end up in the same uh, bin. You, you, you have hashing techniques that will get similar words to the same bin, but uh, for, for this type of uh, feature engineering, you do want them to be as uh, separate as possible. Why? Because in a way, uh, hashing features in natural language uh, acts as increasing the polysemy of, of the word. So the uh, polysemy is the idea that some words mean multiple things. Think of it, the word uh, bank, for example. Uh, it could be bank in a river or, or bank where you deposit uh, money, yes? Um, so when you are doing hashing and you say you, you, you hash door and banana to the same hash, then for the machine learning, it's like English all of a sudden has a word banana door. Yes, and, and it has to distinguish it in the two senses of, of, of that in a given instance. Um, but of course, uh, interpretability suffers when you're doing feature hashing, and but that's true for, for any dimensionality reduction. And also depending on, you have to make sure that the hashing function you are using is stable, like a, Python, for example, uh, randomizes its hashing function. So you cannot use the, the system hash function. Uh, otherwise, you will train the model with, with certain hashes. And when you execute it, the hashes will be all different. And also, feature hashing is quite useful uh, in case of streaming features, which I will discuss at the end of the lecture. Um, so, so 
the, the other technique that is uh, kind of like it's amazing that it, it works even how simple it is, is is just to multiply the the, the feature vector by a, a random matrix. Um, this one is is less random than hashing because it's, it's a projection, so it, it will um, respect the distances and and and, and uh, it is better behaved than than a hashing function. But in general, what you want to do is is something more. Um, uh the, the the projection to be in some meaningful direction yes um but the most common is to use principal component analysis so to, to find the, the stronger direction in a linear algebra sense there is no guarantee that because something is in the direction that um, the um, principal components uh, point to that's meaningful to your domain but uh, that is worth trying. Uh, but if the data set is very, very big, then computing these uh, PCAs are, is very hard. Uh, however, there, there was a, a master thesis in 2013 about how to use MapReduce to compute it. So, so there, there are algorithms to do it over large data sets that you maybe may want to look into it if that's something that uh, interests you. Um, finally, another dimensionality reduction technique is to um, cluster the data and then use the cluster as the feature. Yes, you can use do that uh, using um, non-overlapping clusters or uh, you can use uh, uh, canopy clustering and, and get a dense representation telling you how, how close is this feature to different clusters. Um, and in natural language processing, using synonyms of words is a way of, of using clusters. Uh, for an example, from, from um, a recent workshop I taught on spatial and um, time uh, feature engineering, if you have these dots here, these dots are positions of, of, of different birds uh, in, a, in a bird tracking system. And these are GPS locations and they are very jumpy and they are not necessarily very meaningful on their own. But uh, we can see that uh, k-means very happily cluster these. These are the centers of the clusters in brown. So instead of using the GPS location, we just say, oh, it's in the first cluster near uh, Bauchi. Oh, no, it's in this um, other cluster near um, Gombe. Yes, so, so that becomes much more informative to the machine learning than the actual uh, tiny difference in, in latitude and longitude. Um, so if you are doing dimensionality reduction and then you want to do error analysis and understand uh, what's going on, uh, in a way, well, you, you are taking a, a big hit on interpretability. Yes, uh, sometimes depending on the machine learning method you are using, you, you may be able to um, uh, represent things in a, in a visual way, doing things like, for example, attention maps in, in machine learning. Uh, or the other thing you can do is you can try to invert the reduction for interpretability purposes. Yes, for example, feature hashing can be reverse engineering, but you will require a large amount of memory to do that. So, so these are things that are important uh, from um, uh, their engineering perspective. Um, so in recent years, uh, we have seen in, in natural language processing uh, this um, a, a huge uh, uh, interest on these techniques called embeddings, where you uh, take words and you try to map them to feature vectors so that related words in a semantic sense get close feature vectors. And um, the, the idea is based on the, what's called the distributional hypothesis, where you say that the word of uh, the meaning of a word lies not on the word itself, but in the places where the word is used. So we take large collection of texts and um, we obtain representations from them. And the way we obtain the representations is by um, defining a metric about what makes a representation good and then searching for um, representations uh, based on that metric. Um, this thing has been around for a very, very long time, since like the 50s. Uh, the problem is that before the metrics were all global metrics. And so what we were normally using is try to predict the next words using the previous ones. 
so so you say oh this representation for this word is better because it, now it it predicts better the next word uh, but this is a global search so you have to adjust all representations at once and that make it intractable um, so if you say the context is the cat sits on day and you try to predict the word math, then your output for the prediction is the size of the vocabulary. So I don't know, 50,000 uh, entries. That's uh, too, um, has too many parameters to update, it's too slow. Uh, so in, in recent years, what we have is systems that instead of go from global learning to local learning, and instead of uh, predicting the correct one, they just try to predict the correct versus a small set of random words that are called negative words. Yes, so here you have to predict math versus every other word of the English language. Now you here you take 10 random words that you sample based on some probability and you try to make sure that you predict math higher than any of those negative words. And these things work really well. In reality, it works much better than, than was expected because the, the vectors we obtain from this technique are, uh, have a difference in, in just simple vector arithmetics that correlate with um, uh, meaning. So if you have a relationship between France and Paris, so this is a word, France, that give you a vector, and Paris is another word, give you a vector, you subtract these two vectors, so you have a vector difference. And then you take Italy, and you apply that vector difference you got from France and Paris, what do you get? You get Rome. So this thing uh, has been quite uh, impressive and attracted a lot of attention in, in uh, even in, in, in regular media. Um, and the nice thing about these vectors is also that it can be pre-computed on very large data sets and shared. So, so you can download online uh, vectors computed in, um, uh, billions of, of words. And you can also extend this technique to things that are not just words, but you can extend it to graphs, for example, by using random walk on graphs. Uh, but of, this thing assumes a word per, um, an embedding per word in the respective of context. So in the last uh, three years, we got contextualized embeddings that expand the idea to say, okay, this word bank here is in this context, so most probably it's, you're talking about the, the money bank and things like that. Uh, but these ones are so hard to train that in general, it's only available. The only people who can train them are Google and Facebook, and it costs sometimes millions of dollars in computing time just to train these things. Um, so what the rest of us do is to take these and adapt them to, to particular um, uh, data sets. Um, we want to talk very, very briefly about this issue that uh, there is a, a, a lot of things that go into data science that are not that clear cut, and uh, you may want to be aware of that. Um, so when you are using these data sets, like embeddings that come from uh, uh, historical data, the historical data captures a uh, snapshot of, of reality that is anachronistic, is, is old, yes? So for example, 62% uh, of doctors in Switzerland under 40 years old are uh, women, yes? But if you talk about older doctors, that's only 28%, yes? And on average, it's 41%. So, so if you have uh, embeddings, for example, trained from newspaper articles 20 years ago, yes, then, most probably is going to assume that doctor is closer to uh, men than to women, yes? Uh, and this produces a lot of uh, issues in, in, in a num number of, of uh, directions. Uh, luckily, now there is this whole idea of data feminism and there are algorithms that you can use to unbias your, your um, your um, uh, embeddings and other things. So th these are topics that uh, you, you might be called upon on, on your data engineering expertise to make sure that the system is not uh, falling into any of these uh, issues. And uh, it's important to, to be aware of. Okay, so uh, I'm almost done. So now 
talking exclusively about large data sets for, for closing. Uh, what the large data sets can, in particular data streaming is, um, most of the literature assumes that the features, the raw data, everything is kind of static. You, you arrive at this data, you, you do this cycle, you, do the, you have your model, you deploy it, yes. But in, in many problems of, of, of interest, the data is just arriving. You are, uh, the data is being labeled and, and the models are keep retraining all in a continuous cycle. Uh, so what do you do when the features keep changing? Yes, that's a very, very complex situation. Um, if you think about tweets, for example, and if you're using words as features, uh, new words appear all the time, new, new hashtags appear all the time. Um, and, and so you, you have a period of time where you have this model here that was trained on these old features, and then you have this new data that is arriving and you have to uh, evolve that model. Um, so there are specific techniques that discussed in a, in a recent book, uh, a collection of, of, of chapters. Um, what I would mention that it could be of interest uh, to you if you run into this problem is that you can use um, feature hashing uh, to um, kind of uh, handle this situation. Yes, so as you, as, as you keep retraining your system, the, the meaning of, of, of the hash for a feature will change over time, but uh, at least the, the model will uh, still operate even though these new features are arriving. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention was this algorithm from 1988. We know that it's like a variation of the perceptron algorithm. And um, this algorithm, what it does is it does one pass over the data and it has a linear classifier. So it's a little hyper dividing hyperplane. And if it takes a different, um, uh, instances, if the algorithm as it is trained so far uh, classifies the example correctly, then it doesn't do anything. But if it's uh, predicted incorrectly, then it looks whether uh, the result should be uh, zero. Uh, if the re correct result was zero and, the and a feature was set to one, then the wait for that feature is set to zero. And, and otherwise, if it was supposed to be one, for each feature that is one, the weight is increased. So this algorithm is, is very fast to run, very simple. And after you have run it, you can read from the weights uh, a subset of features that are useful. So th this algorithm is, is normally recommended um, if you need to do feature selection on very, very large uh, data sets. And also you can see that you can uh, combine things, you can uh, run them on, on multiple nodes, etc. And by far the, the topic that I found uh, more interesting on feature select engineering and, and um, um, data engineering is uh, presented, uh, for example, on this paper from 2016. Um, you may be familiar with um, um, the execution plans for uh, SQL queries, where you take a SQL query and you decide uh, how are you going to do the different joints and, and, and um, transform the, the language to be executed as efficiently using the indices you have. So there are researchers exploring uh, similar ideas to um, execute uh, feature uh, engineering um, uh, algorithms. So, so you, you, you say, oh, I want to expand this feature. I want to threshold this. I want to do these different operations over this data set before I train my system. Then uh, there, there is a research being done on that. But the most interesting aspect is because the process of feature engineering is iterative, they want to re reuse uh, the results of earlier operations. So, so you do a run and then uh, you train a model. If the model is updatable, you can say, okay, I, I, I have a, I'm going to change this feature this way. And then their system can say, oh, this only affected these uh, 50 instances. So we can reuse all the other instances, the model we train over all the other instances and only change these 50 instances. Uh, that can have a huge impact in, in execution time. So let's say if it takes you, I don't know, one hour to train the model, 
and you only want to change 50 instances, then that change is almost in instant because you don't need to go through the other hour. Uh, this sounds, um, well, that's okay, you, you, you save time, but it's not only time you save, you also save the context switching on the data scientist. Yes, you, you are the data scientist is focusing on a problem and she sees that this feature doesn't, uh, doesn't work as well, tries to change it immediately, it improved, and it keep going on this cycle. If it takes one hour between steps, then the, the mind doesn't focus as well and, and the, the results are not as good. Uh, other issues uh, with feature engineering are stability. You change the samples and you get different uh, um, results on feature selection, different uh, uh, results on the error analysis, etc. The number of features that are good are hard to, to find. And as I was um, I mentioned at the beginning, uh, a popular topic in, in very recent times is feature stores, where that engineers write features into this store that re read the structured data from, from a data lake, apply transformations, and store the transformer features, and then add documentation, versioning, etc that then is being consumed by the data scientists. Uh, you may have heard or you may see later in the course uh, AutoML. AutoML is, is a technique to automating the ML process and it uh, attempts, uh, it does feature engineering using some uh, predefined set. So it, it explores the space of feature engineering uh, by automatic means. And depending on the data set and problem, sometimes it, it's uh, very successful. Uh, but in general, feature engineering on itself is, is, is not successful. It involves a lot of trial and error. In the book, in the case studies, I uh, had about 50% of success rate on the techniques I was showing. Uh, that's still too optimistic. In general, a, a rate of 10 to 20% is more likely. This is uh, sometimes a problem with people uh, coming um, uh, from having work on exercises uh, and stuff. So in, in, when you get real data, most of the things don't work, yes. And uh, that takes a, a quite a bit of time until things uh, you know, uh, achieve a, a level of uh, performance that is useful. And that's why um, in many cases, feature engineering can help uh, bridge that last uh, mile. So uh, to conclude, uh, feature engineering is a way of adding human knowledge and intuitions to machine learning solution. There are well uh, understood number of methods and transformations that can be done. Um, to me, the process is better than iteratively, starting from exploratory data analysis and then doing error analysis. And because it's so time consuming, well, in general, I advise people just to if they have enough data to use deep learning, or if they have pre-trained deep learning models, try transfer learning. Otherwise, uh, try AutoML, and if nothing, that, then just go over feature engineering. <clears throat> and uh, something I didn't talk much on this uh, lecture because it's um, is that domain experts are, are key to uh, achieve uh, faster and, and better results. Um, many times in data science and data engineer, we, we, we take a very isolated view of the problem and uh, just reaching out to somebody who is an expert on the data can, can have big impact. If you wanna learn more about feature engineering besides my book, uh, there is the book uh, from uh, Alice uh, Cheng and this other collection of papers. And there's a recent uh, book from uh, an R and a cookbook that came up also this year. And um, open for questions, anything you wanna ask, if it's not about feature engineering, just how's the weather on Vancouver, anything. Uh, I, I look forward to um, uh, talking with you. The techniques seem to approach the problem with trial and error. Is there a compass that help us understand for which problems we should start trying techniques by trial and error? There is a lot of understanding about feature engineering for specific domains. Yes. Uh, the, there is like a, a, a trade-off between uh, for, for certain domains that people have worked for a long time, like text or images, we, we understand what type of transformations work and which type of transformations don't. 
So if you are starting from scratch in a completely new domain, then uh, then you will be definitely uh, have a much harder time. Uh, one of the bigger issues with uh, uh, my work in, in general is this continuous question of, is this worth continuously, continues to invest effort on this? Is this going to improve to the point where it's going to, to be of production quality? And uh, in that case, uh, I have found that, um, that the wisdom of the crowd is it's usually quite useful. So, so having a, a large number of people involved with a variety of expertise can uh, help you get a, a better idea about whether um, this system is going into a direction that will actually solve the problem or not. But uh, yeah, it is very frustrating. Uh, I, I hear you. I'll read the question. In your opinion, why it seems to be harder to make feature engineering and build a model on structured data than unstructured? The most of the recent and promising papers are mostly based on unstructured data for what I have found. It's very interesting. Uh, well, uh, feature tools, which is a uh, auto ML. Um, so this is from uh, Valerio. So um, feature tools, uh, which is a um, auto ML um, system I discuss on the book is explicitly built for um, uh, structured data, yes. But, um, but to answer the, the specific question is, the big problem of, of, of neural networks is that it requires um, continuous uh, surface of the error space. Yes, you are using gradient descent, so you are moving around the surface uh, error in a way that uh, has to be smooth and continuous. Uh, that doesn't apply for, well, it really doesn't apply for natural language to begin with, and that doesn't apply to structured data. Uh, the things are discontinuous, so they're jumpy, and, and that makes the uh, neural nets uh, have a very hard time with them. Um, so what people have been doing with that in natural language generation at least, is to do things like, um, uh, generative adversarial network where they do one of the steps using uh, reinforcement learning. Yes, so, so they, uh, th those techniques work, but require a ridiculous amount of computational power and they're very, very hard to understand because you, you are building something that it, it is like an adversarial network, but one of the sides is, is not a network, but it's actually a reinforcement learning system. Uh, so that may be the reason why you're seeing more things on unstructured data than uh, structured data. But uh, you definitely will be seeing it because structured data has uh, a lot of uh, use and importance. Any other questions? What are the must-have professions to have in a data science team? Um, so the, the teams that are assembled these days uh, are for the most part uh, uh, reasonable teams. My main gripe uh, in the industry is the lack of uh, uh, interest on reaching out to experts. Yes, so, so that will be the, so, so data scientists with, with a background in, in, in uh, and data science, uh, project managers, uh, managers, uh, maybe business owners. Do, those people normally are all together working with the data engineers, uh, building the solutions. But um, because of the, the ways the data science teams end up uh, siloed into companies, they don't have access to the experts. And that's a big question right now within the industry. Should, should there be a data science department or organization or should be small data science teams embedded into each organization? So if you haven't separated, then the experts are, are, are really far away. Yes, it's like this person that has 30 years of, of experience working with sales data, why they should help you? Why they should talk to you? They are, you're not even the same organization. You are not on the same management. Yes, they help you and 
what what is in for them, right? Com companies are made out of people, and each one has their own interests. So so they also the other aspect is that. Uh, data science solutions normally are built by machine learning people who uh, feel like using expert information is cheating. Yes, because if you use expert information, your paper will get rejected. You, you are not advancing the, the, the science of machine learning. Yeah. So, so then we, we don't have a, um, a history of saying, well, it can take you two months to, to, to realize that this feature should be squared or 20, 10 minutes in the phone with, with this uh, lady there that, that, that had a PhD on that and knows that it has to be square. Yeah. And um, so in a way, since the system needs millions of data sets to realize, millions of instances to realize that, it's, it's a win because, well, we, we learned that without the expert. So, so that's, that's the only part that I, I try to stress that reaching out to experts and to extra data is something that, um, is important in, in our field. It is related to available hardware. How to predict if something is useful without trail and error because we don't have the same resources as a company. How to determine whether I am in the right direction or wasting my time. Work on samples of the data, yes. So you, you can do uh, bootstrapping, like run the same thing on multiple samples. In reality, uh, that can actually help you get a much better view of, of, of the direction you are going in. Yes, because even if you were to process the whole data set, uh, you, you may be reading too much on something that just randomly happened on, on the whole data set. But if you uh, take multiple uh, smaller samples, uh, you may realize that this insight you thought you, you found uh, is actually very uh, flicky, yes, that, that it doesn't hold out uh, for the whole, um, every time you do a sample. Uh, and that can make your system much stronger in production because it is very common that you train something and then it, it, it doesn't perform very well in production. Sadly, overfitting is, is, is a much bigger problem in the industry than uh, we, we, we realize. Uh, but uh, that, that will be one, one way. Um, there is a, a theorem called the no free lunch theorem in, in optimization. You may have heard about it. Uh, it. It just says that there is no algorithm that will work for every problem. Um, so I, uh, let me see. Over time, as you work on that, some data, you, you, you develop expertise on that data and you realize that this particular type of transformations or operations don't work well and these other ones work well. Um, that type of insight can be captured for different domains, yes? So again, if, if you are working with text, uh, you can find books and papers and blogs and videos that will tell you which transformations you will do that work well for text, like, like dropping, um, um, uh, stop words, yeah. But uh, if you are working with something completely new, uh, then uh, that costs time, effort, and uh, it's uh, a reality. Pablo, uh, since you were talking about data, so how much uh, data do you, what is the uh, rule of thumb? How much data do you use uh, to, to take this view? hold out in order to learn the, the various features that you need to do and so on. So it's like the validation step. So feature engineering, uh, what I normally try to do is because the overfitting is, is really f furious in, in feature engineering <laughs> is um, instead of using held outs, what I do is I I stage the data, so I stream the data as part of doing feature engineering. So let's say I have a data set of a certain size, I split it into 10 pieces. And then I, I, I take the first piece and I do a, a featureization and I do error analysis and I really consume that piece completely. Yeah, and this was the, the, te the, the technique we use in, in the Watson system. 
And after you finish that, you evaluate the system in the next piece. And that tells you how much you overfit in the previous one. Uh, but the, the one is, is, is completely consumed. You, you, you don't use it anymore. Mm -hmm. then you, go, you do another cycle there. And, and then that brings you the issue of you need to, to know beforehand how many cycles are you going to do. Uh, that put you in a very bad situation if, if you don't get to the performance you wanted and you run out of data. But, but that's really for, for problems that don't have a continuous acquisition of data. These days in, in the industry in particular, most problems have a continuous acquisition of data. And, and you can do the same thing um, iterating over stages as, as you evolve the model. Yeah, I mean, this makes also sense because the data, as you were saying before, uh, change, right? So that's an extra but, uh, reason to do that. Otherwise, for, for one go type of thing, you, you can use the regular um, uh, 10, 20, 70 split and just use the, use the development set to do the feature engineering. Mm. And if you have a, a large enough data set, you can even uh, stage the development set to do feature engineering over those stages. And when you are done, then you go to the test and the... Yeah. Are there any tools that uh, help you for the this error analysis, like uh, that automate a bit the process? Yes, yes. The, the, I mean, the, the ones I have used uh, is TensorBoard, this type of things. Mm. Um, for uh, this other um, more uh, uh, very, very specific things on natural language and particular things I have, I just code them myself is, is I found that faster than to rely on, mm. on external tools. But uh, I, uh, I, I spend more time uh, coding and reading blogs, I guess that's, that's uh, an, an issue of the age, I guess. But uh, I, um, there are more tools coming uh, continuously and, and really good quality. Mm. Uh, the, um, my concern with many of those tools is that um, if they are written in Python, they most probably will choke and die with, with a reasonably sized data set. Uh, and that's very upsetting because mm. you see the demo and the demo looks beautiful and then you run it over your just simple okay. dump of the Wikipedia and there's a... Mm. Yeah, I see. Given that Python has this performance issues, which one do you think will be the most appropriate language now or in the future? I'm a big fan of uh, Scala and Spark, uh, but uh, that, that's a very personal thing. I mean, uh, in general, uh, languages are also a matter of communication, yes, and uh, Python has such a large mind share. Uh, so it's, uh, it's, it's hard to beat uh, that in that regard. Um, I mean, I, I wrote examples of, 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 of the case studies of my book in Python, because if I write them in Scala, I, I will be reading it myself alone. But, but you can do really beautiful things in, in uh, the, the, the data frames in, in Pandas, for example, I, I found them very poorly designed, but the data frames uh, in the, uh, are these in, in, uh, in Spark are so beautiful. So th that type of uh, things and feature engineering is, is very, very easy to, to make mistakes that are hard to debug and they completely destroy your model and you don't realize. So having a strongly typed system makes a, a big, big difference. Uh, so if you're using something like Python, uh, you put a string and, and NumPy will happily go for it. Or, I mean, you, you, you or, or, or it will not go for it. And you realize that that after you have spent 10 hours processing something, um, that's, uh, that's, those are real issues. What is better for natural language processing, bear or machine learning models? So my opinion is in the last slide, if 
if neural nets solve your problem, use neural nets. Uh, but uh, you will be surprised how, how many problems in the industry don't have enough data to, to make use of those things. Yeah. So if, if your data set is, is, is really small, you most probably won't get enough mileage from birth because the, the representations you are getting are still uh, things like a thousand, 3,000 features, vectors, yes? So that's a lot of parameters. Um, while if, if you can chop it down to a hundred uh, words or signals from there, then, but um, the, you get easily 20% improvement from using uh, neural nets compared to the non-neural nets methods in, in, in regular problems. So at least 20%. That there is no much uh, discussion that neural nets is the way to go. But what is better, transfer learning with Barrett or neural network trained from scratch? So in, your, in natural language processing, you, you, the, the words don't, you, you will need a tons of data in your data set to, to get this type of semantics of the words that you will get from. The, so th these questions uh, change every month almost. Yeah. It's um, the, the new models are being developed and trained uh, continuously. Yeah. Um, a, a more interesting question is you, you, let's say you do the experiments and decide that BERT with transfer learning work better. Yes. Uh, then a new system comes in a year later. Uh, how do you know whether that new system is, is, is worth switching or not? Yeah. And to, to share with you is this idea that uh, model evolution, yes, it is something that is very, very important in the industry that, that you are missing on thinking about what is the best solution for one problem now. Yeah. It's, it's, you also have to think about it in the, in the longer run. Like this trying these different techniques is something you are doing continuously because new techniques are coming continuously. Uh, even if, 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 if I were to say this technique is better right now, yes, which, which I will never make such a, a blanket statement uh, because data sets are very different, yeah? The, the, um, the, the answer is, is only instantly useful. Over time, it, it changes because technology changes. So I guess my answer is, I'm sorry, I cannot answer that. Uh, regarding your comment about neural networks, so I have seen a lot, a lot of problems that, uh, that have been working. That they, they only have like, uh, categorical data with uh, lots of categories and so on there, it's completely unclear how you would uh, apply the network, right? So, so I would that's just where go... target rate encoding makes a big difference. Yeah, so we, you represent the category as the percentage of time it goes with a particular uh, target uh, value. And then that number is a probability and it's mm -hmm. continuous and it's well behaved, yeah? And uh, that's one of the tricks that, that help you get uh, categorical. But uh, uh, otherwise, uh, well, I mean, with embeddings, people are getting the yeah, okay. words to be uh, things. So um, uh, using random walks on graphs to, to encode uh, notes is something we, we have tried with some research collaborators and it works really well. It's quite yeah, surprising. Also, also. Uh, yeah, text we understand quite well now, right? So embeddings work uh, quite well. And then getting to the previous question, so bad can work well for some problems, but I have also seen cases where, uh, where uh, you know, just doing some ad hoc thing might work better. So it depends, it really depends. It's usually the answer in these settings. Uh, yeah, but- uh, my, my last uh, contract, we, we build a bird system and we build a, a feature-based system and we put all the effort in the bird. We really wanted the bird to work. 
and, and the, the, the other system uh, went ahead. We, we have very small data. It was very, yeah. very limited uh, and that's how we ended up. Mm -hmm. the, yeah. Guys, any other questions and girls? Regarding bias on data, is it a widespread problem? Are there algorithms to detect this problem? This depends on the bias of an expert to detect this. Uh, you cannot detect the bias from the data itself because the data doesn't know it's biased. Yeah, and a little gripe I have with, with the, the techniques and the, the, the domain is that in reality, you are biasing your data set to remove this bias that you find on the data. But the algorithm, I mean, uh, you, you are changing the probability distribution to, to, to account for something you want it to be, not what it is. Yeah, you, you have Mel Chauvinist text and you have a Mel Chauvinist model and you are trying to re take the Mel Chauvinism out of it. Uh, but the same technique can be done if you are a uh, racial supremacist and you want to make sure that your model is, is biased toward a particular race. Yes, I mean, you're, you're actually biased in the system. Uh, so, so these things um, come completely outside the system. Um, so you, you need to have a, 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 a different... So what um, the others on the paper, I... I think I didn't have the slide. There is a paper saying a programmer, man is to programmer as women is to homemaker from uh, 2017, I think. Uh, they are, they, what they said is, well, words should be equidistant between men and women in general, unless they are a, a very specific subset of words that are gendered. So they have this dictionary of gender words, and then they say, well, all these other words have um, a bias for men or women that shouldn't exist. And from there, they use to, to make the correction. And it's very specific to, to gender uh, issues. Um, the thing is, there is a let's do good on the world about uh, equality, et cetera. But then there is the, the, the legal aspect in, in many um, uh, in banking, particularly, you, you cannot discriminate people for credit purposes. So if you're using embeddings and you haven't debiased them, then you are liable. So this type of things is uh, uh, something where the, the request won't come from, from, from the data scientist, will come from the legal department. Yeah. yeah. So... so um, It's a great question. I uh, I think over time what we're going to get is test sets. I mean, there's, there was a workshop on, 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 on uh, gender issues on, on uh, natural language processing uh, that happened twice already. So uh, we're going to get test data set that will allow you to say, OK, this data as it is, is biased, like, like this dictionary of, uh, of gender nouns versus uh, regular, yeah? Uh, so I guess over time we will evolve to a place where we can test certain things. Uh, but for example, this only helps you if you have natural language data. If you have um, GPS uh, trajectories, yes, and they are biased for, for, for some other reason, like for example, bias to able people. And so the GPS trajectories for people on wheelchairs uh, are, are not accounted at all because they are too small on your data or, or they are misaccounted, then, well, you will get uh, a bias that you need to remove. Does it make some sense? Yeah, yeah this is quite widespread uh, now. So at least there's quite some interest uh, now about uh, this removing bias in the last like five years. There has been a lot, a lot of research on this. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, as you say, the definition is not, uh, you know, how you define it is a big, uh, big thing, what is bias, when you want bias, when you do not want bias. So maybe you want some uh, of the features to be protected and you would like the decision to be independent. Uh, the conditional probability is that you choose one class is independent from the other and so on. So there are different mathematical definitions that try to do that. So, you know, there's still a work going on and we have not solved this problem. 
and also related yeah, to, for instance, the example of finance and the banks that uh, Pablo said. So now another area that is quite a lot of interest for this but the reason, but for many others also, it's to come up with models that are what we call interpretable. So they give you an answer and then you would like to know why they gave you this answer. Okay. And one, one of the main reasons is uh, this. So if you reject, uh, if uh, the bank rejected a loan, you know, why did it reject it? Okay, did it reject it because you were black or did it reject it, you know, uh, for some other reason? So this can uh, make, uh, helps to this uh, direction. But it's, uh, you know, something that uh, we are working on and it's gonna take like, yeah, it's not clear when it's gonna be solved, I mean, if ever. But to me, the, the way is that the, the um, training is always anachronistic. You are always using historical data, yes? And as a society, we also evolve. So, so the, the data we have, these texts or anything, was capturing a snapshot of the society that, that no longer exists. Uh, so that's just super important to, to keep in mind this, this model evolution and training data because uh, that's where a lot of failure comes is because, oh yes, you thought that hashtag was a great predictor, but yeah, that was last year. That's so 2019. These days, <laughs> it's a completely different mm -hmm. hashtag and things like that. But, uh, to remove some bias, we need to introduce some of our own bias, right? To remove the bias on the data, we are applying a, a, a counter bias. This is all subjective. Doesn't that lead to politicization of data? And data is a snapshot of, of society. Society is political. Uh, don't know how it's in Italy, but in, in North America, you by law, certain things have to be equal. Yes, you, you cannot discriminate based on, on, on a number of uh, dimensions. Yeah. So those things are, um, are political in the sense of society at large has decided that that's the way it should be. And, yeah. and it's the law of the land. Uh, but um, the idea that data is not political is... Uh, uh, mm -hmm. a little religious in nature. Like th there is this idea that everything that comes from data is correct. And that's why I was pointing out to this. Uh, they give um, 90 teams, uh, 90 people, the same data set about whether race was involved on red cards for soccer. Yeah. In red and uh, then uh, let me show you. I, I went through there very quickly because I didn't have time. But uh, so 29 teams involving 61 analysts use the same data to address the research question whether soccer referees are more likely to give red cards to dark skin tone players. Yeah. And 20 teams, 69%, found statistically significant positive effects. And 19, 31% did not observe a significant relationship. This is a paper written by psychologists from 2018. Yeah. And the idea here is to say, yes, the, the data is objective and it exists, but the analysis is not. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you. everybody has personal biases, um, they, they come through to, to the algorithms and the features we use. Yeah. And uh, I respect you disagreeing, but uh, the, 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 the issue is, is, is more of an, an opinion until you, you get to something that has uh, uh, repercussions. Since the society is biased, wouldn't remove the bias in the data reduce performance. If you have data that represents society and society has a certain bias and then you remove that bias, your performance will decrease. You, you are paying the price of having a lower performance classifier to be politically correct. The, the example I, I built about Switzerland was to show that in that case, it was uh, performance incorrect because most of the doctors in Switzerland now are women. <laughs> yes, 
and, and your model don't realize that because it's trained on all data. Yeah. But, um, but pain for, for being politically correct happens all the time. Like if, if you go to um, a, a restaurant, the bathroom has all these uh, extra um, uh, built uh, to, to accommodate people on wheelchairs. Yes, that costs a lot of money. I mean, the, the, the restaurant owner didn't put it there because their cousin uh, uses a wheelchair. No, he put it there because the law says that they have to make it uh, accessible or they cannot have a restaurant. Uh, sadly, I need to go, but uh, I, uh, thank you so much. And thanks, you uh, this. thanks a lot, Pablo. Yeah, that was uh, very, yeah, very cool. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, thanks a lot.